Hello, everybody. My name is Caraggio Malio. I have a couple of co-authors, Hamangshu Das and Mr. Fred Fenner, and we all work at the Galveston District Corps of Engineers, and I'm the H&H &H branch chief there. My presentation today is on grain size evolution as it relates to dredging and placement processes, and I'm focusing on Galveston Island, Texas. So the project that I'm going to lead out with is a beneficial use project from late 2015-2016 where the Corps of Engineers dredged the entrance channel to Galveston. You can see the Galveston Island right here and you can see the entrance channel. The red sections are where the material was dredged from. Some of it was placed in open water if it, had, if it was deemed to have too many fines. And the material that had an acceptable amount of fines was pumped to the beach from roughly 5,000 feet offshore. Um, some of these pictures, they show the material being pumped into the hopper, and you can see it's very dark, um, almost black. And then you can see the material being pumped out of the beach. It's slightly lighter shade, but it's very, very dark gray. <clears throat> During this operation, we were able to intensively monitor two loads, and we were able to grab 94 samples from the dredged Terrapin Island. Um, 35 of those were inflow and 59 of those were overflow. And we also subsequently collected 330 samples on the beach over three months of the discharge slurry coming out of the discharge pipe. Um, so basically what is shown at the beach pump out picture. Um, and then the water that was running back into the, the water, the carrier water, and also from the beach berm. So ultimately, they ended up placing several hundred thousand cubic yards of material in an area that was more or less devoid of a beach. Um, you can see the pre-picture to the left, January 2014, and then roughly one year post-placement. And they have about a 200-foot wide beach where they haven't had a beach since the 60s. Here's another image of before and after. Um, you can see we have a, the Galveston seawall. And we had some tow protection out in front of it. And only at low tide could you even see the tow protection. During high tide, the water was all the way up to the, the toe of the seawall. Um, and post-placement, we had a 250-foot wide berm constructed. And that berm was basically raised up um, four feet in elevation from its eroded condition. And it was 250 feet wide and roughly around 4,000 feet in length. That material was then reworked and slowly spread out through time along that beach zone. So what did we learn um, from intensively monitoring this dredging process? Well, one of the things that we found is we ended up losing a, a fair bit of material between the channel where it was dredged and when it was pumped to the beach um, for those sections. We lost roughly around 16% of the material during that process. And then when we pumped it to the beach, we ended up losing another 20 something percent. Um, a lot of that ended up in the, the near shore and was reworked and ended up as dry beach later on or became part of the offshore bars. Um, but we, do, we did see a lot of loss of material in this operation. Um, you can see based on this graph, the, the coarsening of material as it goes through the dredging process so the dredge inflow is that first large peak on the left. The native beach is the purple line just below that. Or I should say in situ is in the channel um, before it is dredged. And then you can see the discharge to the beach and then ultimately the berm that was created and then the return water um, that also carries sediment. And you can see that the the material for each step of the process, it slightly coarsens. Um, so that tells us that our sampling regime was adequate to capture what we would expect through the dredging and placement process. During and before and during construction, we also monitored the compaction of the beach since this section of the beach hadn't been nourished um, since the initial construction of the seawall. Um, and one of the things we were closely monitoring was the average 
basically cone penetrometer data strength. Um, and what we found was the precondition and the post conditions were, were very similar from roughly the surface all the way down to 18 inches over a, a whole host of sampling events. Since we knew the material changed relatively significantly, we were curious about how the color of the material changed because the color of the material that, that we had sampled and the channel was very, very dark. And so we were interested to see how that material modified through the dredging and placement process. And so we also sampled for color at both the inflow into the dredge, the overflow at the dredge, the berm at both the berm, the swash, and the dune, um, as well as post fill. Um, and you can see that the, the value increased in time um, through the dredging and placement process, which is what we would expect. Um, because we had a very high amount of fine material. We had roughly 30% fines in this um, dredge material. And so as those fines are winnowed out because they are relatively dark in nature, we would be left with the underlying material that makes up the, the beaches of Galveston Island. In this case, it's, it was 71% quartz sand and the remainder was um, fragments of shell. So here's the mineralogy. Um, you can see that, that quartz, we grabbed the sample that looked like this. It was an existing um, native beach sample and we ran it for mineralogy and we were able to de determine that we had about 71% quartz and the remainder were more or less shell hash particles. We went on to, to monitor another project that happened in 2017, just down the island. Um, it did not come from the channel, it came from a borrow area um, just off the side of the channel within the same inlet. And that material was dredged and pumped with a cutter suction dredge instead of a um, hopper dredge like the previous project. And so it was dredged and immediately entrained and dredge pump and pumped all the way to the placement area. And so this operation was much different. You can see when they first started constructing, they were pumping out in basically cells. They basically contained the area and filled up these cells. And they used the groin fill that exists there as their lateral containment. And so they built training um, berms and built up the beach in, in this manner. And this ended up in training a lot more fines, as you'll see in a few seconds. So here's some additional pictures of their placement operation. You see those longitudinal berms that run along the beach that contain the discharged material. You see the discharge happening in this location. And so this entrained a lot more fine material in the placement operation. So we, we monitored this project relatively rigorously as well. Um, one of the things that we found is that the native beach prior to placement was roughly around 3% fines in this area. The borrow area where they were dredging from and then pumping to the beach, when we sampled that post placement, they'd only went from 9% fines in the borrow area to 8.6% fines. So there were very little losses due to their containment of the dredged material. Um, they were being paid by the amount of quantity on the beach. So that's why they tended to try to contain as much material as possible. And you can see the berm composite versus the borrow area composite versus the native. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is there is a lot more shell um, in the berm composite than was in the native beach or from the original sampling. So the areas that they were dredging um, out of the entire place or borrow area, they actually hit areas that had a lot more shell percentage um, than was found throughout the entirety of the borrow area. So here are some images of the placement. Um, you can see what the fines being entrained did. 
Um, this was after a, a very heavy rain. This was their original beach berm. Um, this was roughly a week post-construction, and then they had about a three-inch rain over the course of about an hour, and the beach actually rutted. Um, very similar to a, a deltaic system. It was pretty remarkable. There were a lot of clay balls. The material was very, very sticky until it was reworked by the winter months. So this data that we collected was put to good use um, in terms of trying to determine based on the dredging methodologies, how the material changes through the dredging and placement process. And so we used a lot of our experience from observing these projects and understanding of physics um, to develop a series of what we believe were parameters that were key to discerning how this material would evolve. And so these things were primarily the number of times the material was rehandled or slurried, the slope of the discharge return water on the beach, thus the velocity of the material running along the beach face. Um, and the, ultimately the sediment fall velocity was one of the big factors. And so we ended up creating a formula that is shown here, um, and it relies on the, the particle Reynolds number um, to um, account for the fall velocity. And we plotted it for various projects. You can see here um, the various, the two projects that I went over. And you can see that the formula is relatively similar to the actual placement event, um, the post fill, um, which is what we found. However, it does not account for shell hash very well, which is what you can see here in this triangular section. We have that same phenomenon in this location as well. And in fact, we had a lot more shell here um, post fill. Um, and so you can see it, it captures the, the tail end, the fines losses, much better than it does the accretement of shell hash. And that's primarily a, a flaw in what the material that was dredged actually was versus the overall extent of the borrow area. We plotted this formula, the results from this formula over a whole host of projects um, from around the Florida and Texas. And we came up with a, a relatively good R squared value. Um, we have not conducted any additional sensitivity analysis, but we believe this formula has promise for predicting based on the type of dredging operation that's going to be employed, how the material will evolve through time. But one thing that we found, and I caution everybody, is that the most critical thing is to characterize your borrow area very well. Um, Without that, your formula is going to have a hard time replicating what was actually seen. So in summary, um, our formula works relatively well. Um, it has promise. Um, in the sediment sampling, we did notice that there was a significant amount of fine losses during the process. And Munsell color and compaction were both similar to preconditions in both of the projects. Questions?